just uh, you know what have been the highlights so far of your of your visit uh, down to uh, Mc I assume you're in McMurdo right now. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I'm in the in the Crary Science Building here at at McMurdo, which is a uh, is a pretty high end science facility. Okay, you know, in a pretty remote place in the world. Uh, there, there's there's um, there's everything here from uh, from uh, uh, biological labs for sea spiders to uh, uh, to uh, geological labs uh, to, um, to, 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 to even the, the, the possibility of doing some some um, uh, 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 some work with with radioactive stuff here so it, it's a pretty uh, <laughs> pretty high-end place and um, I've been uh, back to to McMurdo for the last a couple of days after being out at the, a place called Yesterday Camp, okay. Um, Yesterday Camp is um, is uh, is essentially a bunch of tents out on the Ross ice shelf. Uh, it's called Yesterday Camp because uh, from McMurdo, when we fly there in in these small planes called Twin Otters, uh, we um, we cross the international date line, okay. So actually, when I went to yesterday camp, I was back in your time, except for the fact that all of Antarctica is one time zone. So, so I, I I was not in the same day as I was earlier, but I was in the same time zone. Um, and so all that stuff gets really weird uh, very, very quickly. Um, also, being out at at yesterday camp, it's um. It's it's completely flat. There's no topography. There's no frame of reference of where you are. It's uh, sort of like being out in the open ocean, except it's ice. And um, and once the 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 snow started to, to to blow out there and the fog started to roll in, we actually couldn't even see the horizon. And so there was no vertical frame of reference either. And uh, and so to uh, get back to your question, David. Uh, one of the things that I've, I've I really enjoyed about being here is all the crazy mind twisting stuff like time and space and, and all of that 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 um, pulls the rug out from underneath any of the ways in which I think the world works. Uh, my research question is based on the topic of canines in Antarctica and like how they were used in explorations in like the early 1900s. Um, for you personally, did you leave any like pets at home? <laughs> yes, um, over uh, about halfway down on Wadsworth Street, I have a fuzzy little dog named Bootsy. <laughs> Do you think having your dog with you would make like the transition a little bit better? Um, not at all. Okay, um, <laughs> um, uh, mostly because. Because Bootsy would would go berserk down here, barking at the seals and the penguins all the time. Um, but uh, but but uh, one one interesting thing though is that the the um, um, the, the, <laughs> the history of those uh, of those explorers, okay, d d during the heroic age, you know, in that you know the the very end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, uh, had a lot to do with dogs, a, a lot to do with sled dogs, and um, in the several historic huts. That they have down here, uh, there's there's um, there's plenty of uh, of memories of those dogs. There's 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 the little wooden dog houses. There's there's um, there's boxes of dog biscuits that, that that came all the way from England that were meant to to, to feed the animals. Um, in the in the in the writings of of Robert Falcon Scott and, and, and Ernest Shackleton, uh, there, there's there's a great deal of talk about how those animals were cared for, and um, and 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 they're an integral part of of the of the exploration um, in that first decade or first two decades rather of the 20th century. Um, but um, but by and large, um, there's there's there are no other pets here at all. Okay, the the. There's a a very um, a, a earnest effort down here to, to to make sure that no invasive species are introduced to this um, to this environment, which which is uh, as pristine as as it possibly can be, 
uh, considering the fact that um, that 800 uh, human beings uh, live here at the station right now. What's your, as I understand what you're doing, you're gathering data, seismic data from the University of California team to ultimately transform this into musical compositions. Can you give us an update? What have you done so far to gather that information and, and, and what progress have you made in that project? Okay, good. Thank you, David. Um, there's there's a couple different aspects of that. Okay, first of all, um, I'm when I was out at yesterday camp, I was there with the seismic team because what we were doing we're, we're pulling the seismometers out of the ice that have been there for two years collecting data, um, and each one of these seismic stations um, uh, required um, three three holes to be dug. Okay, uh, about about six feet deep and about five feet in diameter, and then one 20-foot trench. Okay, that that, that followed a a, a, um, a cable that that connected the sensor back to the to the the home base of, of the of the seismometer. And so it was it, it was pretty grueling um, work out there in in the snow. And of course we we we'd go back and sleep in tents afterwards. Um, and, and, and so so um, the rest of the team is still out there pulling those seismometers. Once once they get back to the field, they'll be uploading that data. And um, and probably by mid December, I'll be able to start. I'll I'll start to see what that data is. Um, I, I have looked at the the preliminary stuff that they pulled out uh, last year. And um, and and there's. There's a lot of interesting, interesting um, content there. I think for for music making, translating numbers into melodies, or translating graphic um, representations of the numbers into into melodies and harmonies and rhythms. Uh, so, so that's one part of it. Uh, another part is um, I've been recording environmental sound here, uh, everything from uh, from the snow crunch of of snows at different temperatures, okay. Uh, it uh, it uh, turns out when you're out in a very very cold environment, say, you know, it's it's 15, 20 below zero on on, on the regular basis. Um, it's really hard to have a conversation if anyone moves their feet because the crunching of the snow is so loud. You, you actually cannot hear each other. It's a very uh, noisy, um, crazy environment with the snow crunch, uh, but um, but but I've also been been out uh, to, to a penguin colony. Okay, the the, the Cape Royds <laughs> colony, and uh, I heard and um, and was able to get some some uh, amazing audio of, of of the of the penguins chattering away. Uh, uh, yesterday, I was on a, a one-hour snowmobile trip across the sea ice to go to a a, um, a seal colony, and um, and picked up a lot of great great audio of uh, of this mother mother seal arguing with with her pups uh, that uh, they were giving her quite a quite a hard time, and um, and and so so it's it, for me it's a combination of of collecting the scientific data that'll be translated into music, but also um, seeing what environmental sounds I can get while I'm here. Um, the other source of sounds uh, which I'm really excited about is that I, I'm, I'm working with the, uh, with the US uh, Antarctic program divers here, and, and we've been getting some, some hydrophone uh, audio from, um, from underneath the ice. And, um, for all of the barrenness that we see in Antarctica above the ice, um, below the ice is very different. Uh, it, it's like Manhattan down there, okay, with 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 all the animals chattering with each other, with um, with um, you know you know, s s sounds that, that that you don't think animals could could produce. Um, uh, the seals actually make this this sound that 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 uh, sounds like it, it's right off. Off of um, uh, off of Super Mario Brothers. Okay, this this uh, this a bit uh, uh, very very computer like sort of do like that. And um, so um, so both ga gathering data and also gathering sounds. Well, uh, since you since you brought up the the web link, um, 
have you been thinking about the ways in which you want to be able to take the, the data, the ice sh uh, sheet data, and how you're going to be thinking about converting that to, to your composition? I mean, I mean, I guess you know we're doing we're doing on our website a very mathematical way to take data and just make sounds out of it. It's not really music; it's sounds. And I'm I'm, I'm curious to know how you're thinking about that. Yeah, um, uh, that's been a really interesting and ongoing conversation with the, the, this bunch of scientists down here uh, because uh, the, you know the notion of sonification of data is something that you know people know about here, um, although. Although what um, what what I've found is that is that uh, most of what's been done is similar to the strategy you're talking about. Okay, the the the, the notion of translating these numbers simply into frequencies that may or may not align with with um, with the structures of a of tonal music uh, of the of the white keys and black keys on the piano and. Um, and so, what's been been you know fascinating in chatting with people here is is uh, the, the 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 different functions of these different strategies. Okay, to go directly into sounds, into frequencies that that are are atonal. Okay, uh, that that really provides a a, a, an, a real strong connection to the data. Okay, a tangible link. To you know, between what it, what the sound is and the data, but unfortunately, it it, it creates music that only three or four people want to listen to. Right. Okay, <laughs> you know, because it's an inter interesting intellectual exercise. Okay, but but not something that's going to be a crowd pleaser out there. Okay, and um, and and since my job as uh, in the fellowship here for the artists and writers for the NSF is to get the word out to a larger audience. Okay, what what we've been been looking at here is is a way of um, of splitting the difference between on one end this this very very literal atonal transfer of data into sound. Uh, on the other end, what composers are much more used to doing is sort of you know emotionally responding to an environment by writing music that is what they feel when they look at the environment. Uh, we're going to split the difference, okay? Using some of, of, of the data transferred um, sounds as the source material for, for, for music, but then wrapping that, that source material with, um, with a musical arrangement that is going to tell a wider story, okay? That, that, that's going to be accessible to a, a wider audience. So, so, um, so we're playing with 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 that uh, direct sonification strategy, and also um, the thing uh, you, we talked about briefly beforehand, uh, using using mod seven or or, or or mod eleven in order to to uh, transfer data points into tonal music. Okay, that 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 actually actually create sound, create you know viable melodies and stuff. Um, I'll I'll be trying out all that stuff once I get the data, and then um, see what we get out of it, and see what what can um, what can fit the needs of the NSF here for um, for telling the Antarctic story. Uh, right. Actually, I had a question on behalf of, of my students. Many of them are in class today, but one of the things they've been looking at are the artists who accompanied some of those heroic yep. age explorations. And what they're finding in the, the photographers and the writers, and, and also the way that writers who didn't go to Antarctica imagined the landscape, is a, a simultaneous sense of beauty, that this is a, a really incredible place, but also terror, that it's a, a really scary place to visit. And I wondered, your impressions in that, that sense, as an artist visiting there, what, what do you think about the landscape that you've been moving through? Oh, I, I completely agree with them, um, that, that the, the, the beauty of this place is a terrible beauty. It is, it is a, it, it's, you know, the, the, the sculpting of, of the snow, um, the, um, the, the uh, reflections off of, off of the ice, the, um, uh, the volcano that, that sits a quarter mile from where I am right now, which is the southernmost active volcano on the planet. 
um, it, it, is, it is a very frightening place for human beings. Um, uh, humans were not meant to be down here. Um, and, um, and I think in many ways that's, that's part of the allure um, because it is uncomfortable. Um, you know, to, to, to be out at, at yesterday camp and to be, you know, you know, sleeping in a tent at 15 below zero, uh, uh, to be losing all sense of orientation. Uh, the only way that we could know where we were was, was with a GPS unit. Um, that, that, you know, you know, every movement taking extra effort, every, every thought being survival, um, that that uh, that on one side you, you, uh, a, 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 a very understandable reaction is why would you ever go to a place like that <laughs> okay but but on the other side what I've found is that um, that that the landscape really forces you to strip away distractions in your life okay people don't walk around with their phones here Okay, um, uh, people look look each other in the eye. There's a palpable sense of common purpose and and mutual protection here. Okay, because because whether you're a dishwasher in the galley or whether you're you're a PhD NSF scientist, um, it's cold to all of us all the same, and the dangers are all the same. And so uh, and so I think part of part of the beauty that um, that I see. Which, which I think resonates with, with, with a lot of what we've heard from, from the heroic age of, ex, of exploration, is this notion that, um, that um, we get uh, uh, the, the trappings of civilization stripped away down, down to the bare necessities. And it's going back to those bare necessities are the things that, 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 that generate the greatest beauty of the place. Um, Shackleton's quote, um, you know, after having rescued everyone, you know, he says, he says, we have seen the naked soul of man, um, and um, and so I think, I think um, uh, for me, that is what's really driving driving a lot of the beauty and a lot of the inspiration here. You know, it's 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 kind of like um, the 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 uh, medieval Irish monasticism where. Where, where the monks decided to go to the, the most desolate places in the world in order to find God. Um, this, this is obviously not a, an overtly um, a, a religious place. It, it, is a, it is a place uh, dedicated to science and, and, and logic and evidence, but, um, but it is a place in which people search their souls a lot, okay, whether that, that soul is framed in a religious context or, or not. Oh, oh, and by the way, Joe, um, the implementer that I have, the person that is in charge of making sure that my my project, you know, goes off down here and I don't die and you know, you know, you know things like that, um, is uh, is a wonderful woman who um, is a, a retired history teacher, and um, and she actually has some uh, some some stuff uh, she's going to dig out of her archives, where when um, when Robert Falcon Scott came. Came here, okay. In in that first expedition, 1901-1902, they built this, you know, you know, the hut, okay, on Hut Point that I sent the pictures of, okay, uh, on the on the blog, and um, and and what Elaine was explaining was that was that they they parked the ship in McMurdo Bay, and they built the hut as this sort of extra storage facility. It wasn't meant to be lived in at all, okay, and. Um, and 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 what she said is that there's 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 information that that while they were that they were in the ship okay and passing the time uh, evidently the the crew of the discovery was actually putting on plays for each other they, they 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 were doing Shakespeare they were doing all sorts of interesting things down here um, that 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 go beyond just the the artists and, and photographers that we've that we've seen. Um, uh, one other interesting little little point about the huts uh, that there's 
there's three of them here in this in this part of of Antarctica, all lining up with with the with the Scott expeditions and the Shackleton expeditions between 1901 and 1916. And um, uh, as you may have have seen in my blog last week, uh, Secretary of State John Kerry came down to visit visit us here, and um, and when he went to the um, to the Shackleton hut up at Cape Royds and and was looking through all of the various products that were up on the shelf um, his um, his chief of staff had the had the foresight to notice on the shelf a container of Heinz ketchup okay um, uh, uh, for those of you who aren't aware uh, secretary Kerry is 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 married to a a woman from the Heinz ketchup dynasty uh, so uh, so uh, uh, that was a wonderful connection uh, going back back over a century. So Dr. Fletcher would like to know if there are researchers there of various nationalities or different countries? Oh, okay. A great question. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, most of the researchers here at McMurdo are, are Americans or else they are, are, um, are researchers from other countries. Uh, so simply using McMurdo as as their base of operations, but um, but I've had chats with with a um, with with a Russian fellow who runs the uh, the uh, telescope operation at the South Pole base. Um, there's there's a um, there's a SEAL scientist here from from Belgium. Uh, we have. Uh, we have a handful of folks, okay, from from different different countries here at the base. Although, um, just just adding to the spirit of your question, um, uh, when I flew down here from Christchurch, New Zealand, there were a whole bunch of Italians on on the um, on the airplane because uh, uh, because just around the corner from us is is a uh, is a base that that the Italian Science Agency runs. Okay, so, so so it's an entire Italian base, not too far from here. Uh, also, th there's a there's a Korean base, not too far away. Uh, the uh, the Chinese are, are actually working very hard these days to establish their own base, but but they're they're a little bit behind schedule on that. But um, but Antarctica is a place that no single country owns. Okay, and the and the treaty that, that was put out, I believe, in 1959, um, you know, expressly states that that Antarctica is is a place that that is for the whole planet. Um, that, that the environment needs to be preserved. No one can weaponize this this continent, um, and and much of what uh, of what that treaty was born from was the Cold War. Okay, where, where the, there, there was, there was um, talk about whether whether the Americans would put put a military base here, okay, or the Russians would, and um, and so in in response to those Cold War fears, uh, this 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 treaty in the late 1950s, um, you know, established Antarctica as a as a um, as a fully international continent. Um, also, just to, to get dimensions, sort of, sort of you know, get your mind around dimensions, the land mass of Antarctica is roughly equivalent to one and a half times the lower 48 states of, of the U.S. Okay, and in the Ross Ice Shelf, okay, this 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 part of the continent where I've been doing most of my work at, um, that has no land underneath it. It's it's just just a just a big. Um, uh, sort of, you know, uh, a kilometer thick piece of ice uh, on the ocean. Um, the, the the Ross Ice Shelf is about the size of France. Um, so so uh, so uh, so we get a sense of some of the dimensions. So I'm not sure if it was touched upon, but uh, I'm researching like the pop culture that has come from Antarctica, and I'm just wondering what you guys do for entertainment when you guys aren't working. Because there's a movie called South Vicinity that came out, and that was basically made because people were bored and they made a movie. <laughs> um, yes, this this station here at McMurdo, um, of which the population fluctuates on any given day, sort of between maybe 750 to a thousand people. Okay, 
um, is is a place that is is filled filled with music and it is filled with art. Okay, uh, walking from building to building, you not only see um, see uh, photographs and, and and paintings and sculptures done by people in the artists and writers program, but uh, but also art art created by by everybody here, whether they're scientists or or support staff. Um, the, um, the there's live music all the time here at at McMurdo. Uh, there's a there's a little coffee house that's that's made out of kind of a 1950s Quonset hut uh, that um, that has um, has Thursday open mic night at it. Okay, and and also Saturday shows. I'll, I'll be doing a show this Saturday um, at the coffee house. And um, uh, there's a uh, uh, there's a bar here called Gallagher's that has a bonafide stage on it. Okay, that that has ev everything from from touring musicians from from New Zealand to um, to bands that are that are formed by by people here. I think it's I think it's um, it's it's punk rock this this Saturday. Okay, at Gallagher's. Uh, but but um, there's um, uh, there's regular um, like uh, swing dance here. Okay, my my son Matthew was 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 very happy happy to hear that there's 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 a two step uh, dance club here. Um, it, it's a it's a very vibrant artistic place, and um, and and it's 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 marvelous to see um, to see how how prominent a role. Um, Music and, and 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 dance and um, and the visual arts play in a community like this. Uh, this is not this is not a place of a bunch of boring stuffy scientists. Okay, these people are a whole lot of fun, um, and um, and the food's pretty good here too, by the way. So, yeah, actually, for for those of you in in, in working with Joe that. Uh, that are researching, you know, the, um, the 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 artistic life of of Antarctica. Uh, this is a, um, you know, to, to to actually put together a full history of that. Okay, is um, is just is just ripe for the picking right now, uh, because um, you know the, the artist and writers program is over a decades old a decade old. Um, plus, the, the, there's this this long history of the of of the scientists and, and, and the support staff um, uh, doing doing music here here as well um, actually on the third day that I was here uh, uh, you may have uh, have seen in the news because it made it all the way to the Washington Post and the New York Times uh, one of the the um, the, uh, the beloved scientist down here who'd worked for, for, for many many years uh, died died tragically in an accident out in, in one of the crevasses uh, and um, and so the second or third day that I was here uh, I was playing at a memorial service and um, and and since the fellow was a great fan of, of, of Scottish culture uh, I borrowed a, a, a violin from the gear shop here okay the the violins and guitars are, are like next to the ski boots and the ice picks, okay, over in the gear shop, um, and um, and I found a crane operator who played guitar, okay, and and the two of us played played a whole bunch of Scottish dance tunes for for um, uh, for Gordon's Gordon's memorial service. So um, so it's it's an easy place to find artists and, and, and musicians. You're you're down there with some of the most advanced climate scientists in the world, and how. How have they embraced what you're doing in terms of melding the sciences and the arts? Is, have they been have they been with anyone doing a similar thing before? How are they taking what you're doing down there? Um, it, it's it's really fun uh, because um, you know from the from the first early steps of applying to this program a year and a half ago that um, that. Ev Every scientist that I've talked to down here has been um, has had this attitude of, of of rolling up the sleeves and being willing to do crazy things, okay, and and to talk with people outside of their disciplines. It's a it's a very uh, very open minded, very uh, very welcoming community. Uh, there's no prima donnas down here, okay, and um, and and so uh, uh, for example, uh, every Wednesday night, 
okay, they they have a science lecture, okay, here in the in in the Crary Science Building, and so um, and so they had me give give the science lecture last night, uh, and, um, and and of course I wasn't I wasn't um, um, talking necessarily about science, but I, but I was talking about the, the the ways in which in which musicians and scientists can work together, and the place was packed. Okay, and 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 a and a whole bunch of of the scientists afterwards said said you know gee I have this data right here okay can can you can you show me how to put it to music you know and and so it's a, just a you know palpable enthusiasm and and um and and energy toward this this sort of thing uh, that that I uh, find everywhere here uh, uh, a really great bunch of people. Uh, so, how far along in a composition have you gotten? Like, how far have you gotten with a piece? Yeah. Um, well, well, the I've been playing with 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 some ideas. Okay. Uh, 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 some just just purely musical ideas. Just just you know myself responding to the landscape here, uh, as well as playing around a bit with. Some musical ideas that are that are imitating the sounds of of Antarctica, uh, but but in terms of moving toward the final product, okay, um, I'm definitely uh, um, waiting for that data to come through because because the assumption of my project is that the data is what drives you know the core content of the music, so um, so uh, I'm hoping to get that that data. You know, around mid-December or so, and start to sift through that and and see what it what it says. Um, but but I think that that um, there's there's something that that has uh, been been coming back to me a lot during the month that I've been down here. That there's um, that the, a while back I did a. a a fellowship at the Kennedy Center in, in Washington, D.C., uh, where um, one of my projects w w was to work with this um, this woman from from England, who's a touring classical percussionist, but she's also deaf. Okay, and and uh, Evelyn Glennie is her name, and um, and one of the things that 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 Evelyn um, sort of talks about is that is that um, when she lost her hearing. Okay, as a little girl, one of the things that she realized was that was that her ears uh, were only part of what it meant to interpret sound. Okay, and 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 she makes the point that for all of us, we think that we take sound in only with our ears, but actually our entire bodies resonate with with the sounds around us and actually play a role in our interpretation of the sound environment. And so. Um, one of the things that that has struck me about being down here is that, um, in, in, in order to to sort of tell the story musically, um, it requires this sort of different way of listening, okay, a different way of 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 um, of looking not only for those audible sounds, those sounds within the hearing range, but also these you know subsonic sounds that that, that come from from the seismometers um, that, that, that my scientific team works with. Uh, just like Galileo used a telescope to extend his sight into, into space uh, and be able to see more, okay, here the scientists uh, are, are using various technologies to extend our ability to listen to what, to, to, to what Antarctica has to say. Um, the specific program that that, that, that that I'm working with on the ice shelf, uh, the assumption here is that the waves that come from the top of the planet, you know, in, in response to storms, tsunamis, whatever, those waves travel down here to the bottom of the planet and they create pressure underneath the ice shelf. And so and, and so the wave forms that 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 occur within the water are are then are then replicated in the ice in this kilometer thick piece of ice the size of France and it bends and heaves okay with those vibrations when we're camping on top of that ice 
we are also part of that story. We're, we're part of that, that vibration. We are bending and heaving as well, even though our, our, our senses can't perceive them by themselves. And so, and so uh, one of the things I've been exploring is, is this notion of, of how is it that we listen in new ways, okay? Um, uh, uh, listen to the story that, that the ice and the animals are telling us here. Um, in ways that are not just sort of a romantic artistic idea, but also also a, a, an idea that's that's borne out by hard science. We hear a lot about Antarctica as the sort of canary in the coal mine. Do you have a sense of what the scientists are saying about climate change and uh, the work that they're doing there, and how that helps us better understand the, the state of the planet? If you'd excuse excuse the pun, it, it is a hot topic down here. Uh, that um, and and it was certainly a topic that was in the forefront of Secretary Kerry's remarks to the station last week. Um, we um, uh, just is it two weeks ago now? I think it was two, two or three weeks ago. Um, Kerry was part of the effort to sign uh, the 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 Ross Ross Sea Marine Protective Treaty. Okay, which is which is the the um, protection of the largest. A single marine environment on the planet um, right now. It was a huge victory of, after, I don't know, probably uh, eight or nine years of negotiation with many countries. Um, the, the, um, the team that I'm working with out on the shelf uh, is, is looking at the way that the shelf is a predictor of climate change because, um, you know, for two reasons. That, that um, you know, we see the the end of the shelf, you know, calving off and breaking off into the sea, okay, and that is um, is is not only a function of temperatures rising, but it's it's actually a, a function of these infragravity waves, because uh, what the hypothesis is that they're testing is that the um, that that increasingly volatile storms. Okay, on other parts of the planet, create extra pressure underneath the ice, and 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 every time that heaves up, okay, or or a wave goes through the ice, it is it is uh, putting micro fractures into into the ice, which means that it's going to be easier for it to break off on the other end, and so and so it's that there's um there's so much of what people are are are, are doing down here that is either directly you know, related to climate change or or indirectly. Um, this this is a place where 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 we're going to see it happen first, um, and and those signals are already already here. Unfortunately, I was just wondering once you actually make your music, how are you going to get it out into the public, and how do you think it will change public opinions about or shape public opinions about what you're doing? Great. Great question. Um, it's going to happen in several forms. Uh, certainly, there will be a, um, a, 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 a an online version of it. I'm going to be able to not only use um, sounds from the environment here, but also video. Okay, from the environment, some amazing pictures of of um, of seals vocalizing underwater and and and, and, and stuff like that. So, um, so there, there will be sort of multimedia packages that'll um, that'll be available, things that, that I create as well as things that um, will be created by high school students that are also part of the project. Um, but, um, uh, but also there's there's going to be a live option here as well. Uh, for example, um, uh, I'll I'll be writing some pieces for choirs, okay, and so. Th and so the the music will will go out to the high school choir, the college choir, the the you know the, the adult community choir, along with these these audio and video packages. So so the um, so, so that there's a, a combination of the live performance of the music with okay with the um, with the audio and and the video to accompany. It. Okay, so so um, so th those kinds of things will be will be distrib distributed through the publishers I work with, okay, and through the through the network of music directors that I have, um, uh, not only here in the U.S. but also in in Europe and some other places. One of the things that um, 
I, I've actually asked your second question to a lot of the scientists here. And, um, and, and one of the things that they say over and over again is that um, with, with the science that they do, um, you know, the fundamental act of a scientist is to seek truth that is not dependent upon the individual and especially not dependent upon the emotions of the individual. Okay, it has to be facts that are freestanding, that are true from one individual to another. Okay, so because of that, when they put together, um, you know, climate change data sets or, or penguin population records or that sort of thing, um, it's a bunch of numbers and graphs and that's a hard thing to communicate to, to, to the public. Okay? And, and over and over again, what they've said, s said to me as a, as a musician, uh, they, they say, um, you know, our, our work is meant to be devoid of emotion, but we are emotional people. We are full human beings doing this work, and, 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 and it is that emotional connection with an audience that allows an audience to get interested in learning about the stuff. And so I think in, in many ways the, the, you know, the job that I have is to, is to create those, those, um, those, those artistic um, pieces that are the invitation to an audience to say, gee, okay, if, if, if um, McClure got this, uh, got this interesting melody out of ice data, gee, I want to know more about the data. Because this is cool. This 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 gets me pumped up. This gets me excited to go into the next level of of understanding what happens. So 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 I think that uh, that's very much the meeting point between um, the uh, the scientists and and the artists down here. Um, in the beginning of your question, you brought up the idea of visuals um, being used for like your project. Um, I'm, as I said, I was doing research on a couple of movies that came out about like Antarctica, primarily South Sandy and the Thing. Um, but there's also a novel mm -hmm. by Edgar Allan Poe, uh, Arthur Gordon Pym in Nantucket, um, which is also, they're all horror-based uh, lines. So like, what kind of visual effects would you say in Antarctica revolve around giving them the idea of a horror-styled story? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, that uh, that a lot of people down here have very strong opinions about. Uh, that there, there's a whole wide range of, of feelings about those films that you're talking about. Um, that that uh, some folks think that oh, it's great to get the word out no matter what, and other folks are very critical of them. Um, for all of you Humanities Two fans there, you know, in the audience, <laughs> okay, you know that we read travel literature in in Humanities Two. Okay, Gulliver's travels uh, uh, being being one of, 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 of many possible books on the list and of course one of the things that we that we learn ab about about travel literature and tourism literature is that oftentimes they are written with the um, with the traveler as the protagonist okay that that we learn about the new place by by the feelings of the traveler okay um, you know uh, what's what's the what's the PBS guy um, uh, the the uh, uh, travel journalist uh, Steve what's his name I uh, can't think of his name but 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 um, he's a guy that 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 is sort of you know embodies this notion where 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 he walks into into the Pantheon in in Rome um, and um, and and uh, you, you know talks about about the Pantheon and all this inflated language. Oh, oh, it's it's magnificent. It's beautiful. It's it's beyond imagination. It's breathtaking, and none of that says anything about the Pantheon. <laughs> okay, but 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 it's all about sort of focused on him as the journalist, and and I think that um, that what what um, what folks sort of realize here is that is that it's a tricky business to to tell the story of, of things down here without it starting to, oh, oh, Rick Steves, that's his name, okay, okay, with, uh, uh, without it turning into sort of a Rick Steves thing. Um, and, um, and also that, that uh, in some of those movies, there's a lot of interviews of different people that are down here. And, uh, and, 
and some folks have been very critical about the characterization of the community here through those particular people that they happen to ch choose to to characterize stuff. So, so it's a it, it's it's a really interesting to sort of get the the inside scoop on on these films that are that are that are down here. Um, you know, you know, we can't expect everyone to have a uniform impression of their time here, but um, but you know, once once we start turning a a live human experience into an artistic product, okay, we have to make choices of what goes in and what and what doesn't, and and I think that that uh, with the passion that people have for this place, uh, it, it's especially with film, it's hard <laughs> hard to to um, to please people, I think. Um, also, it's top on uh, what weather or like just visual aspects of Antarctica makes it that look kind of horror, like for a horror style. That's another question about the horror aspect of it. Yeah, it's it's the sort of thing where where the the, the easiest narrative to tell down here, okay, the easiest story to tell is 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 man's you know fight against nature. Okay, that's the that's the the uh, central s story of the, of the of the heroic age of explorers. Okay, okay, man enduring. Okay, the um, the environment here, but but the thing is, is that um, you know that that sort of cliche story, um, I think, was really really good in in the heroic age because of course you know Scott and Shackleton were coming down here for for both their own glory, okay, to be in the history books, but they're also coming down with a real sense of nationalism, okay, wanting wanting England to be the first, you know, to uh, to, to to do this, or or the or the Norwegians to be the first to do things, or or, or that kind of thing. Um, but but there's this sense of conquering that that, that and 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 um, and subduing the environment, okay, that's. That's uh, that's inherent in those stories. Here at McMurdo, there's none of that. There's no conquering of this place. Uh, the work is equally as heroic and equally as dangerous. But 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 I'd like to suggest that we're actually in a new heroic age of exploration here in Antarctica. But it but it's not an age of of, of individual glory and nationalism. It's it's an age of heroic scientists. Trying to figure out how we should live with the planet as opposed to conquer it. Okay, and and I think that 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 is a story which has not been largely told in these movies. Um, it's it's all too tempting, I think, by a, a filmmaker or or a um, or, or, or or a journalist or or, or a blogger. I, I know I felt the temptation myself as I've been as I've been writing these blogs in the last month of sort of putting myself in the role of of the of, of the person who's enduring the elements, you know, for the good of art or or or, or, or some sort of schlocky, you know, um, journalistic stereotype like that. Um, I think there's a different story to be told here, um, and I think it's the story of, of a new heroic age of scientists, uh, uh, rather than and and her heroic age of of conquerors. So when do you come back, by the way? Um, I'll be coming back a little bit before Thanksgiving. Okay, uh, uh, it, it, that is all, of course, dependent upon the weather, uh, on uh, uh, because uh, th there's there is no human schedule that that um, that can um, that can take precedent over over the weather in a place like this. Uh, that folks have to be very flexible and 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 ready to to throw things to the wind at any moment. Um, but uh, but if everything goes well, uh, next Tuesday I'll be flying to New Zealand. Uh, actually, I, I I flew down here on what looked like a commercial airliner uh, flown by the New Zealand Royal Air Force. Uh, but I will be flying out on uh, on a um, an LC-130. Okay, it's one of the military cargo planes, uh, and I'm and. I have to change planes because in the month that I've been here, the sea ice, okay, is 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 um, is starting to soften out there, and of course the the airport runway is on top of the sea ice. So uh, so so for the next month or so, um, in order to land land big planes 
and, and take off, they, they have to be planes with either many, many wheels on them, okay, or with skis on the bottom. So, um, so it, it's. Uh, I, I'll be. I'll be be having my first ride in a in a in a military plane uh, on on the way home. But um, but but uh, just a just a final word here. Um, you know, in in the study abroad business, okay. One one of the things that we talk about a lot is is why do you travel? Okay, do you travel for a vacation? Okay, to to sort of forget your worries at at home and and and, and turn off your brain. Okay, that's that's one re reason to travel. Um, another reason to travel is to go to a place and learn something. Okay, um, uh, you, you know, for for folks folks at Geneseo, certainly uh, study abroad and traveling is oftentimes a good resume line when you're applying to graduate school. Okay, if you've gone and done an interesting thing somewhere but um, but but so far this this trip has proven I, I think the best way of traveling and the best reason for traveling is 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 t is to go and be transformed to go and get your posterior kicked in ways that that, that you can never imagine uh, to get your brain squeezed squeezed and wrung out like a wet towel okay and and your um, you know your assumptions challenged about about how the world works. Um, I know I know for myself as a as a 52 year old. Okay, my body has been challenged in ways that that it, that it never has been um, before down here. And I think ultimately that's that's a really good reason to travel is 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 to go and be transformed and to come home. Um, uh, of uh, uh, knowing some stuff and understanding some stuff that that you didn't beforehand. Uh, there's there's a, one member of my team that that told me when we were out in the ice, uh, he's been down here seven or eight years doing this work, and uh, and Michael said um, he said in in his very very sort of humble tone, uh, he he said he said you know Glenn, uh, uh, every time you come down here you leave a little bit of your soul here. Okay, and and I'm very much feeling that that right now that um, that this continent has already already chipped away a couple pieces um, off of off of my soul that uh, that will not be going back home with me. Uh, so so it's a it's it's quite an amazing place.